Thank you very much, Sergio, for um, that presentation. Um, so we're going to wait a moment uh, for the presentation to show here on the screen. Um, so WebQuest, and the first question I have for you, it's what is a WebQuest? So I would like, while we get to the presentation there, have anybody heard of this concept before or what comes to your mind when you hear the word WebQuest? Anybody, not everybody at the same time, please. Just one at a time. Yes. Well, it's a structured activity for students where they're given a, a question to answer or a problem to solve, and then they're, they also have a certain sites that they get information that enables them to do that. Okay, a problem to solve, a situation, and then they are provided with websites, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yes? Hunt as well. Maybe they have something that they have to go and search for and investigate about. Same. Maybe they might be provided a situation with mm -hmm. some links and, and things like that. Great. Thank you very much. So, yes, one more participation uh, there. I was going to say, is it similar to like a genius hour or a genius five minutes where you give students a topic and they kind of can use resources that are provided or resources that they're aware of? to get as much information as they can, kind of as a prior knowledge or as an ongoing like research in a topic, if you have like thematic teaching or unit planning. OK, thank you very much. So all of these three definitions are part of what a web quest is, all right? So my topic is web quest as a didactic strategy to enhance autonomy and self-regulation. And I would like to contextualize why autonomy and self-regulation, well, mostly because I started working with WebQuest in the, midst, uh, in the midst of the pandemics, right? So the idea was to help students who were working uh, at a distance, so to speak, even though we know it was more emergency remote teaching, right? And also we used WebQuest for distance education at UNED in the past. And that's uh, where I started. I remember it was probably 2015, 2016, where I heard of WebQuest for the first time. I participated in one. They, they provided me with a WebQuest that I carried out myself as a student or as a learner. And then I said, well, this should be, or this is something interesting. Let's find a little bit more. And that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to look at WebQuest. So in the next slide, uh, we are going to see the following slide. We're going to see the agenda for today. Um, the purpose is to explore the theory supporting the implementation of WebQuest and characterize the step to building a successful one and, of course, analyze some of the benefits of this. So um, the, we're going to look at uh, some theoretical context, uh, conceptualization of WebQuest, where it comes from, where we can go with uh, the WebQuest, the stages, how to design a web quest and what can we do? What uh, tools do we have to design the web quest ourselves and implementing web quest in the EFL uh, classroom, okay? So let's begin with the conceptualization. We're going to be talking about a little bit about distance education and see how distance education or, or it is important because the idea here is that we can use WebQuest in the classroom, but I use them in distance education. So we're going to talk a little bit about distance education, self-regulation, because that's part of the topic, right? What is self-regulation in learning? How do we understand it? How do we promote self-regulation? And um, ICT supported um, learning. And of course, the WebQuest. So let's begin. Distance education, and this is a definition, I think the simplest definition I could find by Garcia Aretio. Garcia Aretio is a referent in distance education. He's a former professor. He recently uh, retired. He's a former professor from UNED, Spain. And he tells us that e-learning and online learning, because these are two concepts that people sometimes start wondering about. What is distance education? Is distance education the same as e-learning? as online learning, and am I doing online teaching, all right? So he says that even though these concepts might differ quite a bit, basically e-learning and online learning are no other than a format of distance education supported on digital technologies and ICT, 
okay? So distance education, it's basically, there is a distance between the teacher and the student, physical distance between the teacher and the student. There is this whole concept, we don't have um, cl uh, classes per se, we have tutoring sessions, that's what happens in distance education. But in these two uh, types of learning, what we have is somehow distance education supported by ICT. So um, there are seven requisites provided by Holmberg, and you're going to see that this theory is a little old. Uh, well, I wouldn't say that's old enough because I was born that year, so. Uh, but for theories, it's a little old, and I want you to pay attention to some of the requisites that Holmberg provide because it's not new, but he was talking about technology back in the 80s. Okay, so we need adequate feedback. If we don't provide adequate feedback to our students when they are in distance education, uh, we are not doing our job. So that it, we know feedback is important in the classroom setting, adequate feedback is important in the classroom setting, but it's even more important. It's one of the requisites in distance education. Why? Because our students are doing most of the jobs by themselves. So if we don't give them the adequate feedback, they're not going to be learning and reconstructing that learning that they already have. The second requisite is teacher-student motivational relationship. So this is very kind of a lonely process. Distance education is kind of a lonely process. And for those of us who have done a lot of virtual experiences as students, we know that many times we enroll in a course, it's a seven week course, and we don't talk to anybody during those seven weeks. We do a lot of reading on our own. Uh, we post in the digital platform, we provide uh, or we upload the projects, but then uh, it's on our own. So there needs to be a motivational process that goes both ways. Students motivate the teacher, but teachers also need to motivate the students. So when we provide students with forums, with activities like WebQuest that we're going to see in a moment, we need to make sure that we are motivating our students. The third requisite, it's a well-planned and organized process. I remember back in 2020, hearing some teachers uh, uh, in our primary and secondary systems that they said, well, what I do for distance education is I connect, and if my students have questions, I give them the answers. I don't have to plan that much. And that hurts, right? Because being in a system for, uh, uh, in a educa uh, distance education system, this is part of the process. This is nothing that comes out of the blue. We need to plan and we need to organize the process. At UNED, for example, every quarter, our students receive all the guidelines for the entire term. And they receive, when they open the platform, it is already organized in units or by weeks or by months, and then they have the resources, uh, they have the activities, they have the extra resources. Everything is so organized and well-planned accordingly. So distance education is not something that we can do just out of the blue. We need to prepare just as we do when we have face-to-face -face interactions. The next, um, the next requisite is dialogue to get meaningful learning. So this dialogue is not necessarily we teachers talking to the students because we don't see them very often, but there needs to be a dialogue in the materials that we provide our students with, okay? They need to be pedagogically mediated. Uh, we, we do that mediation from the content, from the form, but also in the learning aspect. So you're going to see that when we talk about distance education, many of these uh, materials that we provide our students, you are reading a document and suddenly it says, now think about this. And there is a question for you to think about. Or visit this website and answer these questions. After you did that uh, process, reflection process, now here are some of the ideas that I have as a teacher. So that material, it uh, possesses a dialogue. All right, it's asking the student to think a little bit to reflect. The next requisite, it's tech tools for permanent communication, okay? Back in 1985, when this uh, theory came um, about, it was the radio or the television or the post, right? The mail. 
I remember my mother learned to cut her by mail. She would receive all the different materials, she would study them, and then the following month she would receive uh, module number two of cutting hair, right? And she started practicing and that's how she learned. And it was very interesting, or now that I think about it, it's very interesting to see that she learned to cut hair just by reading, by mail, right? Distance education. The next one, it's a friendship-like relationship where we support one another. Now, I always say that we cannot be best friends with our students. There is a phrase, I, I don't remember who said it, but they say, when you try to be a buddy, you become a nobody. So we're not buddies with our students. We are more friendship-like relationship. We respect one another, we support one another, we understand one another, and we help one another. That is what friends do, right? Mm -hmm. And the last requisite, it's self-regulation and self-instruction. And you see this is from 1985. So these are two key aspects for distance education. And that's why my talk refers to or relates to WebQuest, but also self-regulation and self-instruction. Um, because if our students do not learn to self-regulate and they do not learn to self-instruct, this is going to be difficult. I have always said I have done this for a while as a student. I didn't do my major in a distance education university like UNED, but I have always said I really admire students who do their full major at a distance university because I am not that disciplined. I need a classroom. I need a teacher. I need somebody that says, remember next week you have homework. Remember the project. And at, at UNED or distance education, this doesn't happen. You really need self-regulation. You don't have a schedule. You need to set your own schedule. And I am always setting my schedules for everything. And when I go back to my agenda, I say like, oh, I, I had four things to do today and I didn't do any of those. I did something else because I'm not that disciplined. So that's part of self-regulation. Um, next, so what is self-regulation? And this is Zimmerman who says that self-regulation is a self-generated uh, self thoughts, feelings, and actions that are planned and clear, uh, cyclically adapted to the attainment of personal goals. When we talk about self-regulation, we can talk about feelings. How do I regulate my frustration? How do I regulate when I feel sad? When I feel angry, how do I self-regulate? How do I react to those? But when we talk about learning, we're talking about those feelings, thoughts, and actions to learn, okay? And they are cyclically planned. We're going to see that cycle. So the cycle starts with planning. I need to plan what I'm going to do. I need to plan my learning strategies. Let's think about vocabulary. I want to learn some vocabulary. What are some of the strategies that I can use to learn vocabulary? So I'm going to keep a journal and I'm going to write every single word that I think of that I don't know how to say in English. I'm going to write them down and at some point during this week, I'm going to translate them into English. Um, I don't know, I can write a sentence and I can write the definition. And then I can revisit those words every now and then. Another strategy, I can start uh, do, using post-its, right? And then here I post something that says chair and table and TV around the house. That is another strategy. I need to plan the strategy. The second one is execution. I need to put that plan into practice, okay? And then what I do is that I reflect, okay? I say, did it work, okay? I have um, my self-regulation about my day. I, I know for sure that I cannot use digital calendars. And people, I love technology, I use technology a lot, and people always tell me, my friends always tell me like, how come you have a physical agenda? And I love having my physical agenda because I have already tried. And the problem is that I have a calendar in Outlook, a calendar in Gmail, a calendar in everywhere. And then I don't have everything together. So my physical agenda is I have everything together. Okay. 
I have everything at once. And that's what works for me. So I have planned, I have executed, and I reflected. And based on that reflection, you continue or you start the cycle again. And you say, oh, this, this, uh, this didn't work. I'm going to start again on planning, executing, and reflecting, okay? Now, when we talk about ICT and learning, and this goes back to 1998 when we started using technology in the classroom, but I think this is very updated or we can use it up to date. We have two ways of using technology in the classroom. Our students can learn from technology, and this is basically what you're doing right now. You're sitting there, I'm using technology to present, okay? Students can be very passive when, when that happens. So if we think about technology or learning from technology, we're thinking about um, audio and video, okay? So, or we provide readings and we provide a live worksheet, for example, to my students. So it's like they receive a lot of things, right? And they are just receiving information, a lot of input, which is really necessary. But then the other way is learning with technology. And it's when our students take control of technology and employ technology for their learning. So when they create a podcast, when they create a blog, when they write an email and send an email to somebody, or when they have a, pe a pen poll uh, via the internet, for example, right? That is learning with technology. However, we have seen these very kind of separated. We either do one or the other. My idea and my thoughts is that we need to integrate technology. In the classroom, we need to provide our students with opportunities to learn from technology that is very necessary because we need input in our lives to learn the language, but also we need our students to do some output and to use technology in order to learn. Because if we keep on uh, learning from technology, basically what we're doing is transferring the traditional and the most traditional methods into technology. So instead of using a whiteboard to write my ideas, I'm using a PowerPoint presentation, okay? And that is very traditional. And sometimes people say, yes, I use technology every single day. I still don't know how my students don't like my classes. Well, because every single day you're lecturing your students for three hours using PowerPoint or using Canva or using Prezi or any other tool, right? Although I must say that it's very interesting. I used to work for many years with elementary school students. And it's very interesting because sometimes the most traditional things when using technology, students love. Like instead of copying from the whiteboard, you give your students one slide with a sentence to copy and they get, they get excited because they have to copy from that slide. I don't know what goes into their minds and that should be very interesting to carry out a, a study about that, right? Or instead of, sometimes it's the, instead of me giving an explanation, what I did was, okay, today we're going to watch a video that I prepared and they watched the video and they were excited because the teacher was on TV. Okay, and it's still very traditional, but I think it works somehow, okay? Now, if we go to the web quests, web quests are not something new. They started in the 1990s, um, kind of in the middle of the 1990s in the United States. There was this professor who decided to do a project with uh, his students, and he said, okay, I'm going to provide my students a set of websites and they are going to learn about a topic. But I don't want them to drown into this huge uh, sea of information that is the web, right? So I provide them specific websites, and my students are going to learn from those specific websites. And then this professor noticed that it was very useful. What is the theory, or what are the theories behind WebQuest? We have project-based learning, as some of you mentioned at the very beginning, the idea with WebQuest is that my students are going to be carrying out small projects, okay? So the WebQuest that I'm going to show you uh, in a moment or some of the, of the uh, screenshots at least, students, what they had to do at the end of the WebQuest was to create a podcast or a video, an instructional video. 
and that was the project. So that is project-based. We also have problem-based, okay, learning. We can provide our students with a problem. There is a problem. Uh, let's talk about uh, high school, for example. So the problem is um, how do we deal, or we, we have a lot of waste around the school. How can we re reduce waste? That is the problem. How can we solve that problem? So that is part of what we can do in a web quest. We also have inquiry-based learning, which is letting our, stu our students to do some research on their own, guided research, but research in the end, because we can provide our students with 10 different websites, and maybe they need only five of those websites to finish the project or to solve the problem, or to give a solution, all right? And then what we are trying to do here is to promote meaningful learning. Why is that meaningful learning? Because students are doing. They are not just receiving from the teacher, but they are doing, okay? And by doing, you take action in your learning. You are going to be in control of your own learning, all right? So this is the simplest definition of a web quest I could find, and this was provided by the Programa de Aprend uh, Programa de Apoyo Curricular y Evaluación de los Aprendizajes at UNED, okay? So I translated it. It says that a web quest is a didactic technique that requires the resolution of a series of tasks using a set of websites on a specific topic provided by the teacher, allowing for a more guided exploration. Students must look for and use gathered, uh, use, sorry, the gathered information in a final task, okay? So if we see this over here, I, I think I would also add task-based learning because my students are carrying out small tasks to complete a bigger task, right? Uh, and you're going to see that actually the stages of a web quest can also be kind of equal uh, to task-based, pre-task, task, and post-task as well, okay? So if we continue, the sections of a web quest. So we agree that a web quest is something my students do online. Uh, however, I have also seen many different ways of doing web quest. I can even download all the websites into a folder and give a flash drive to my students with all the information so they don't require uh, internet. In the case our students don't have internet, I can use uh, that folder. I can use a Word document, for example, with all the sections and then hyperlink the folders or the, the files in the folder to the, uh, to the Word document, okay? So that is the most basic thing we can do with the Word document, but also we can do something online, very fancy, depending on what my students, uh, what their connection and their uh, context is. So we have an introduction. That is the first section that we need to provide our students with. And the idea, and you're going to see here that we are kind of starting with the self-regulation process. We want our students to know what is it that they are doing in this uh, project, in this web quest? What is the web quest about? What am I going to be learning? And so they start taking control over their own learning, okay? The introduction can be something very simple, a couple of sentences. It can be providing them with a story so they start thinking of the problem, if it's a problem they're going to solve, et cetera, okay? The next uh, section is the objective. This is key when we want to promote self-regulation. In Spanish, and I think this is probably something we say in Upala, but we say, el que no sabe para dónde va, Cualquier camino es bueno, o cualquier trillo es bueno, all right? So, in this case, we need to know where we're going, and so do our students. If they don't know the objectives, how are they going to measure whether or not they're achieving those goals, okay? So, we need to provide them with clear objectives. By carrying out this web quest, you're going to be able to identify members in the family, uh, describe your own family, and express likes and dislikes of your family to say something, right? The next section is going to be the task. 
And this is a very quick description of the task. So after, or for you to do this uh, web quest, the main task of the web quest is going to be preparing and recording an oral presentation. That is the whole task. Or your task is going to be uh, recording a podcast, okay? Now, something we did at UNED with the web quest that we, uh, that we carried out is that we provided our students with opportunity and flexibility. We told them, you can decide whether you want to record an instructional video or a podcast. So it was kind of the same product. We wanted to hear our students' voice, but then you decide how you want to do it. If you decide to do an instructional video, there was also option. You can show your face or you don't show your face. It's just a set of slides and movement and everything, all right? The next section is the process. And now here is where we go step by step telling our students what to do. So you see that this is very, um, somehow it's controlled, but also my students are going to be very clear on what they have to do. So step number one, you need to write a definition of family, I don't know. Or step number one is you're going to look at this link and study this video that talks about the family. Step number two, I want you to take this quiz based on the video you watched. Step number three, I want you to draw your own family. Step four, five, six, third, step number 10, record the video showing your family, okay? So this is step by step. The process needs to be very, very um, guided and very specific for my students to be successful. If I just tell my students, watch all the videos that are here and prepare a podcast, like that is very general. Some students might be able to do it, but for some other students, this is going to be very frustrated or frustrating, sorry. Um, the next section, the resources. Here is where we provide our students with all the resources they are going to need. Even though we somehow provide the resources in the process section, because we say, I want you to visit this website. I want you to do uh, to watch this uh, video. I want you to do this um, quiz. There needs to be a section where we provide all the resources. So in the case of the web quest we prepared, it was one part of resources for the main topic that was academic writing. That was the all, all the different uh, resources for academic writing. And another section in the resources part where we had how to prepare an instructional video or a web quest because we also knew that some students didn't know how to do it. So we needed to provide them with the links and some ideas. What are some of the uh, software you can use to record yourself, to record your voice? How can you make a podcast more uh, beautiful, let's say, right? The next one is the evaluation. And this is key in self-regulation. Students need to know how they are going to be evaluated. I was really shocked the other day I was in a, in a workshop and it was a workshop on, on evaluation. The person, the, the expert was telling us, remember that it's important to create the rubrics or uh, everything and provide it to the students. And one of the teachers says, um, uh, we never, in my institution, we never provide the rubrics beforehand because that is helping our students and they copy from the rubrics. And I was shocked. If you have, if you're from, from my uh, generation, you know what Condorito is, right? I was like, plop. You need to provide your students with the rubrics, with the evaluation. This is how you're going to be evaluated. And this is helping my student, okay, carry out the whole process. But before you give me the final product, go ahead and check the rubric, do a checklist. Did I do an introduction? Check. Okay. Was my video from five to seven minutes? Check. If not, I still have time to go back and rearrange what needs to be rearranged. But this is an important section in the web quest. And the final section is the conclusion. We want to let our students know this is the end of the web quest. Congratulations, you have finished your work, 
okay? So you see that this is step by step, the whole process of the web quest. There are uh, two other sections that are optional. One is a guidance for teachers. So you can put that in case other teachers come to visit the web quest, they can see like the instructions, the teacher's uh, textbook, let's say, okay? Instructions for teachers or considerations for teachers, right? And there is another one that is credits. You can also provide credits, okay? If you prepare the video, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the different sections um, that we can, or the two extra sections that we can include. Actually in the theory and most of the theories, they don't include those two sections. Those have been added uh, over the years, right? Now, let's continue, and we're going to see some examples here. The first two pictures over there are um, two web quests that we created. And you can see that, well, this was a matter of time. You can see that they are very original both, right? Uh, it was a matter of time, so we didn't have enough time to prepare both like very differently. And there were two different groups. So we decided to keep the same kind of structure and they are in Google Sites, okay? Um, and this one is createwebquest.com. It's a website I'm going to show you at the end. So you can register for free and you cr can create your own web quest. They are very simple or the, the interface is very simple. It's kind of a Word document that you get at the end, but you provide your students with a link and they enter there, it's online, et cetera. And it's very simple to use. But if you want to be more, uh, I don't know, creative, let's say, or if you want to invest more time, I recommend Genially. You can create amazing web quests using Genially. You can create web quests using uh, PowerPoint as well, or you can use Google Sites, which is free, and you can do wonderful things with uh, Google Sites. So, this is the web quest for academic writing. So I'm going to read very quickly. When my students go to the homepage, they get the introduction. So it says, what is academic writing? Why is it important? How do I achieve it? These are some questions you might be asking yourself at this moment, mostly because teachers tend to ask you to use an academic style in your papers, okay? So I provide it with some context, and then I continue saying, okay, this is a web quest, College students are required to do this. Through this web quest, students will research more in depth about this topic to become better academic writers. Enjoy your quest. That is the introduction. That is telling them, this is what you're going to be doing. Enjoy, okay? If we go to the next section, which is the objectives. So you see that there is a set of objectives. This is what you're going to achieve in the end, okay? Um, we can call them objectives. We can also call them purpose, okay? So in this case, it was to identify the, be the basic elements in academic writing, to list the different types of academic, to differentiate between academic and non-academic, and to apply the obtained knowledge in the creation of an instructional video, okay? Um, so here we have the uh, process, okay? So the task was basically explaining what it was, and then the process. You see, number one, it says, here you have to go to this Padlet. And what I like about Google Sites is that I can embed the Padlet, the video, the quiz. I can put everything inside the Google Sites so students don't have to go from one place to the other, okay? So what you see here, it's actually a Padlet we created. And it was, okay, I want you to look at this Padlet. There are, uh, I think there were, four different columns. I want you to look at the first two columns that was kind of activating prior knowledge and complete those two columns. After that, you're going to watch this video, okay? What is academic English? And then I want you to take this quiz, okay? There was, oh, sorry, I, it, it is not there. There was a quiz. Again, it was an external platform called ProProfs and we embedded it into the website. And you see that we continue, number four, five, six, and seven. So number seven is you go to the Padlet and you include the link to your um, video or to your podcast in the end, okay? Here is the evaluation. So we included the evaluation we were going to use that is very important for our students. 
And of course, the conclusion. Academic writing can be a little uh, threatening in the process of writing an essay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Congratulations, you have successfully finished your web quest. Okay? So you see that the whole process is guiding the students from the beginning to the end. And now, is this a lot of work? I wouldn't say so. Probably the work comes depending on where you're going to put it and how much you know about the software itself, okay? If you already know Google Sites, it's going to be very easy. If you don't know about Google Sites and you want to do it, well, probably you need to invest more time learning how to use it and, and uh, doing trial and error, okay? But generating the content is not that complicated, okay? It's just uh, you have the section, so it's very easy to go section by section. You write what you want to write there. The resources, that is probably another section that might take a little bit more time. We want to offer our students very good resources, right? And that might take time for us. Now, what is the idea here? This, uh, this particular web list was part of a research course. In the research course, we didn't have time for academic writing. It was very crowded with a lot of other things. But we noticed, or we had noticed, that our students had some problems with academic writing. So we did this more individualized. Students were learning on academic writing. We noticed improvement in their writing. And also, um, what happens here is that uh, we didn't want our students to access any materials they could find on the web. We wanted to provide. We want to. We wanted to provide very good materials. Okay. So here is where actually we can also show our students how you choose good resources in a research, for example. So that can also be kind of. Um, kind of embedded there, okay? I teach you, or look at the, uh, the sites that I chose, and you see those are good sites. I can use that also as a learning experience. How did I chose those sites? Well, they are academic, they are from universities, uh, they have these characteristics, etc. okay? This is the website I told you about to create web quests. So it's createwebquest.com. You log in or you create, um, an account, it's for free. And then once you enter, you click on create web quest and it's going to show you something like this. So it's a panel where you put the title, the introduction, the task, process, evaluation, conclusion, credits, and teachers page. You see this one has the two extra ones that I told you about. Um, if you don't want to put any uh, one of these, for example, I saw some that were kind of for elementary school students, first, second grade, they included only introduction, task, and I think process, and that was it. I would have liked evaluation though, at least, okay? That even though they are first graders, they knew how they were going to be evaluated. So what are the advantages of um, using web quests in the classroom? The first one is the development and enhancement out of, out of autonomy and self-regulation, definitely. My students are going to become more autonomous. Even though I am telling them, this is what you have to do, this is the final product I want, you can let them be very autonomous, okay? They need to learn everything by themselves, like creating the podcast or creating an infographic. You don't tell them how to do it. You provide them the resources from which they can learn, so they become more autonomous, okay? You can give them flexibility. You can either prepare a three-slide PowerPoint presentation, a Canva infographic, or something else, okay? Um, the next advantage, it incorporates ICT in the teaching and learning processes, definitely. We know that our students want, and they are eager, to learn from technology, but not only looking or seeing the teacher use technology, they want to use technology on their own. So we give them technology here. And what I like about WebQuest is that actually I am 
I am confident that my students are going to be using the materials or most of the materials that I want them to use. So they have the freedom, but still there is some little control beforehand on my side. Because sometimes when we give students the whole power, and this is kind of, the idea is to give them total control. But sometimes when we start using technology in the classroom, we teachers are a little afraid. And what happens if? What happens if I give them something to do and they cannot do it? What happens if they go to website they shouldn't be going? So the idea is that I am letting go little by little using WebQuest. The next one, it allows students to demonstrate their personal abilities. Definitely, okay? In any WebQuest, you can think of anything they want to do or they you want them to do at the end as the final task. And you can always provide your students that room to show their personal abilities, okay? It was very interesting because in the web quest we created, we and uh, Tobias is here, Tobias is part of the cathedra that we, in which we implemented this. And we were talking at the beginning and what happens with students if they have limited internet connection, right? Are they going to be able to do it? And at the end, we were very surprised with the results. Students who we, barely listened to in the tutoring sessions. They created amazing podcasts. And we didn't even know they had that amazing voice, okay? And they did beautiful things, okay? Videos, amazing videos that they created. So they, it, it potentializes personal abilities. It minimizes the time invested in looking for information on the students, okay? Many times students say, oh, the teacher wants me to research on this, but when I do academic writing, I get 20,000 results. Which one do I look at? Okay, which one do I examine? Which one do I study? So this minimizes the time invested looking for that information. It fosters critical thinking through decision-making processes and creativity. So even though you might be saying, why decision-making processes, if I am telling them what to do and what I want at the end, well, students can decide to go the whole process step by step, or they can say, I already understand what I have to do. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to see the evaluation. Do I really need to go to that process, or do I need to open the resources, examine the resources, and create the final uh, task, or carry out the final task, okay? Also, they can decide, okay, I want to do everything. I, I am already in the main task, but I want to go back to the objectives or I want to go forward to the evaluation and I want to check. So that is decision making, okay? And critical thinking as well and cre uh, creativity. Every web quest or most web quests I have checked online, they have something that leads students to be creative. Preparing a little something at the end. Okay, preparing a poster in the classroom. Maybe they do the web quest at home and then in the classroom as a group, they prepare a poster. So every web quest, the idea is to promote some creativity. Then the competence that we can, or competences that we develop with uh, through web quests that are also used in EFL, okay? Comparing and identifying. They need to compare the different websites, the information they get here and the information they get there. They need to compare, are these uh, two websites similar? Is the information similar? Is it too different? They need to identify the main aspects, classifying elements into categories and deducing uh, possible results. The next one, they need to analyze errors and look for solutions as well. And that is something we always do. We saw that in the first uh, talk today, right? Analyzing some errors. Is this right? Is this wrong? How am I doing here? So um, that is something they do through websites or through web quests and generalizing uh, through observation. They observe, they examine, and they make generalizations. Academic writing, I have six different resources, and then I need to generalize. What do all of these have in common? And then make generalizations. When we teach grammar in EFL and we do inductive grammar, students start generalizing. Why is it that in some cases I say, or why do I say went, okay? Or why do I say um, were, right? 
So they start making those generalizations and those conclusions. And the last one, critical thinking, definitely, okay? This is what we want. This is one of the four C's for the 24th centuries. Creativity, critical thinking, and I forgot the others just now. Um, but critical thinking is definitely one of those abilities that we need to encourage into our students, okay? So with this, I am very thankful for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, I can send you the examples that I showed, unfortunately. They say technology is great, but sometimes when we have too much technology, it hinders our ability to manipulate stuff and things. But uh, you have my contact there, my personal email, uh, my uh, UNED email. You also have my Facebook account, phone number. It is public, don't worry. Uh, and also, that book that is coming up next uh, month, uh, it's part of a, an effort in Costa Rica, and it has a chapter integrating technology written by myself. So I hope it is beneficial for you as well. And thank you very much. I really hope you have great web quests in your classrooms. And I'm opening the floor for questions. Thank you very much. So let's see, do we have any questions in the room? I can go to you with the microphone. Okay, just give me a second. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I do have a question. A web quest was meant to be done individually or in teams? Because when it comes to working in groups, mm -hmm. does the process go through? The same way or it changes? Great question. Uh, web quests can be done individually or it can be done collaboratively, okay? The only thing is that we need to make sure that we promote collaboration and not group work, right? Not like you do your part, I do my part, we put it together, there's a Frankenstein or, or, or the, the, the monster from Dr. Frankenstein, right? Um, we promote collaboration. Another thing that I forgot to mention is that there are three types of web quests. We can have long-term web quests that usually take a month, two months to solve and to carry out. There are short-term uh, web quests that it's, this one that I showed you was a short-term. It was meant to be done in a week, okay? A very specific week. And we also have mini quests. And these mini quests can be done in classroom, for example, in just one day, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. We do something very quickly and that's a mini quest. So the, of course, what varies is basically the task that we're going to ask our students to carry out. It's never going to be the same. We cannot ask our students to, uh, what, prepare a podcast in a mini quest, right? Or to uh, draw something very simple in a long-term quest. And also the resources. The number of resources we provide our students will vary depending on the type of quest. When you were talking about the quests to create a web quest, you mentioned uh, that step number three was setting the task, and step number seven, well, number seven, sorry, was setting the conclusion or the state of the finished goal. So, since we're talking about a website, um, I understand this is my question is it different? Like, the conclusion part is different to the task production or delivery, or can they go together like an inspection? Here's where you upload your product and you have reached the final of it. Like, thanks for participating. Mm -hmm. Well, the conclusion is actually uh, from the teacher to the students. It's kind of a closure to the whole process. It's where we wrap up as teachers and we tell them, okay, during this way, web quest the idea was for you to learn more about academic writing you did this by watching a video by taking this quiz and you already posted your uh, video online so thank you very much for carrying out the whole process now you have finished so it's we teachers giving them the the closure of the um, process right of course if we we can add the conclusion, for example, I am thinking in the conclusion section, we add a Google form where they upload their final work and when they click submit, they see the conclusion. That can be something that we can also do. Mm -hmm. Can I have another question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you said 
actually used to work for Meg. I'm working for Meg's uh, currently. So when working for Meg, would you use this as a homework, as a project, like as extra classic? Mm -hmm. Because of all the steps that it takes, right? And then what kind of population would you use it with? Because I'm thinking, I, I think you said something about first graders, but my parents are really special. <laughs> so if I ask them to watch a video, they're like, teacher, but I don't have time. I don't have internet. Nah, 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 nah. So what kind of population would you work this with? Mm -hmm. I used this uh, in 2020, where we were totally distance, right? And during pandemic, I used it with fourth graders at that time. And it was very short. It's, it was kind of a mini quest to do at home. So of course, they would probably use more than 30 minutes. They would use an entire week, etc. cetera. Uh, but I would do like a mini quest and it, it helped a lot. I noticed that many students were doing their work and they really liked it. They say like, teacher, I like that activity that you provided with, uh, provided with. So it can be done, I think, with many different levels. I only did it with fourth graders. Last year, I did one with sixth graders, uh, but we did a mini quest in class. So one of the things working with public, uh, for public institutions is internet connection. And we know many students don't have the same possibilities. So what I did was that we used, I used some of the computers from the school and we, I took them to the library and we set some, um, what I did was like kind of some, um, what is it, carousel in the classroom or in the library. And then some students were working on the mini quest in the computers and other students were working on something else. And I keep rotating them. So they had the opportunity to do the quest. But that the quest was the easiest part for me to carry out because it was step by step and they were able to do everything on their own. You're welcome. <laughs>